Murder So Cool by Guy N. Smith We're probably wasting our time. Detective Chief Inspector Brown pulled the brim of his hat down in an attempt to shield his dour features from the rain which lashed down from the surrounding mountains. My guess is that it's just an unfortunate accident. But it happens to be a high-profile tragedy soon after the opening of Glendower, Scotland's answer to Silverstone. The owner's ambition is that Glendower will be to motor racing what Glen Eagles is to golf. This business is in the public eye, on the front page of every newspaper, and we have to be seen to be doing something, Odell, because the Masterson team is claiming that Jim Trace's car was sabotaged by the Cagliari team. I was praying that the forensic examination of the wrecked car would unearth some mechanical fault that had caused Tracy to go out of control, but it didn't, and the buck has been passed on to us. One paper is even claiming that there's a hoodoo on Glendower, that the laird who owned the land before the turn of the century has put a curse on it. When the estate went bankrupt, the land was sold to the highest bidder. Sure, this was once the home of Red Deer, and the racetrack has driven the herds to seek new pastures, but that's the way of the world today. Anyway, I'll feel easier knowing that you've investigated the case. The last thing I want is some piece of damning evidence coming to light at a later stage. Well, I'll see what I can do. Raymond O'Dell was tall and lean. It was difficult to judge his age from those lived-in, aquiline features. He had worked with Brown in the Glasgow force years ago before taking early retirement. But retirement had proved dull, and O'Dell had returned to his old job in a private capacity. The official force were jealous of him, even Brown sometimes, he guessed, but they were glad enough of his help when they came up against something they couldn't handle, like the Glendower tragedy. A much younger, fair-haired man watched and listened intently. Tommy Bourne had worked with Odell since qualifying for a criminology degree at college. Jobs were not easy to come by north of the border, and Tommy's uncle, a police sergeant at Inverness, had known Odell well so Adele had taken the young man on a six-month trial period. The situation had become permanent, and the two men now worked as a team. They had an impressive record of successes, often cases that the police had consigned to their unsolved files. This might just be another one of those. Odell was on his hands and knees examining the burned-out remains of what had been claimed to be the most up-to-date Formula One car ever to go on circuit. It had lasted a mere three laps. Tommy gazed in awe from pit one out across the famous circuit, standing on an elevated platform outside the entrance which commanded an unrestricted view of the track, a position usually occupied by one of the maintenance crew where, as well as monitoring the race, a fault which was not yet obvious to the driver might be spotted as the car approached. He had watched the first ever competition held at Glendower on television. It had been hyped as a new era in motor racing, certainly a boost for the Scottish economy. Never in his wildest dreams had he anticipated standing right here in what for himself had already become a shrine. It was exactly like it had been on television. He experienced a momentary sense of unreality. He recalled every detail, even the charred patch barely fifty yards from the pit where former world champion Jim Tracy had crashed, attempting to regain his crown. That had been shown on the evening news yesterday. Just looking across from here sent shivers up Tommy's spine. With an effort, he forced himself back to reality. If there had been sabotage, even murder, then he and Odell would need to draw upon every reserve of their powers of deduction to solve it. The pit had a touch of luxuriousness amidst its oil and grease. An adjacent room was fitted with easy chairs and a table. There were cooking facilities and a small cooler where team members could fix themselves iced drinks. Well, the experts have gone through the remains of the car with a fine tooth comb. Odell straightened up, wiped his hands on a piece of rag. So there's little point in a layman wasting his time trying to unravel mechanical technicalities. Now, let's have a look around the pit. Tools and equipment hung from hooks. Others were laid out on benches in a neat array in readiness for when they were needed to carry out a split-second repair or to change a set of wheels. On the nearest bench lay a pair of powerful binoculars. The Glasgow detective picked them up, examined them. Doubtless kept here for the purpose of scrutinising the team car, he muttered to himself. Eh, what's this? Tommy and Brown, peered over Odell's shoulder, saw a circular scratch that had scored the surface of the binoculars just below the lens adjustment. It looks like some kind of attachment has been screwed to it at some stage, Raymond Odell muttered, scrutinising it with the aid of his powerful lens before returning it to the bench. 
Interesting. He turned back to his companions. I think before we go any further, I'd better have a word with the Masterson team. Frank Masterson himself, and then the mechanics. Then I'll talk to the Cagliari team. I think we need to hear both sides of the story in this bitter feud, don't you? He was a brilliant driver, Frank Masterson spoke scathingly. But he hit his peak, and after that there was only one way he was going, downhill. There was no way he would ever be world champion again. I tried to tell him that, but he wouldn't listen. Head's too big for his helmet, always was. Downright snob, too. He was gutted when his daughter Claire started going out with one of the mechanics. Masterson laughed. <laughs> Just imagine it, a world champion's daughter going to marry a mechanic out of the pit. Claire was so besotted with young Sam Wyman that for maybe the first time in her life she actually stood up to her father. There was a row and she walked out of the family home. Personally, I wish the couple well. Good luck to the girl for sticking to her principles, even though her father threatened to cut her out of his will. He wanted me to fire Sam Wyman. <laughs> no way! What the team do in their own time is their business. Then I poured salt in the wound by telling Jim Tracy that I wasn't keeping him on after the end of the season. He went berserk at first, and then settled back down to racing with even more determination than before. He was out to show me and the rest of the world that he could make it back to the World Championship again. I wished him luck, but I knew damn well that there was no way he would ever hit that kind of form again. Of course, the Cagliari team still regarded Jim as their most serious rival, and to be honest it wouldn't surprise me if in some way they were responsible for Jim's death. Something so clever that it left no trace and it will always go down in the records as just another accident. Masterson shrugged his shoulders in resignation. Had there been any threats? Odell's eyes narrowed. Aye, a couple, the other nodded. Telephone threats to Jim's home a week or so ago. Somebody somehow got hold of his ex-directory number, guy with an Italian accent. That doesn't necessarily mean that it was one of the Cagliari team. It could just have been a deranged fan of theirs, and nothing at all to do with them personally. There is plenty of Italians living in Britain, not to mention those who have come here over here specially to watch the heats. But the team were reusing the media, trying to drum up publicity, and there's nothing the public likes better than hostile rivalry. It was all a bit over the top. Agnelli, their manager, was quoted as saying that Jim Tracy was likely to kill himself trying to regain his world title. Which gets me thinking. How long has Wyman worked with the team? Odell asked. Four years. Prior to that, he was apprenticed to the gun trade in Edinburgh. He was an all-round first-class mechanic. He might even have set up as a clockmaker he was that versatile. Anything technical and Sam could adapt to it. He had that kind of brain. As I've always said, I think that somehow the Cagliari team are responsible for Jim's death. They've fixed it so that it looks like an accident. Done something that even the forensic guys won't be able to rumble. Well, you mustn't jump to conclusions, Raymond Odell smiled. Now, I'd like to talk to Sam Wyman. From what you tell me, he probably knew Jim Tracy as well as anybody, for better or for worse. Sam Wyman was in his mid-twenties, fair-haired and with blue eyes that met the detective's gaze unwaveringly. Yes, he replied to Odell's question. I'm going to marry Claire Tracy, but we're going to wait a little while in view of her father's tragic death. She's upset, all the more so because they parted on such bad terms. Me? I, I don't bear Jim a grudge. There's no point. He thought his daughter was marrying beneath her, but she stuck to her guns. Whether Jim lived or died, it would have made no difference. Anyway, knowing Jim as I did, I guess he would have come round to it and accepted me in due course. He was that kind of fellow, hot-headed. I, I let it all wash over me. I'm a member of the Masterson team, and Jim was still their number one driver. It was my duty to do everything I could to make sure he won. Was there rivalry between you and Jim Tracy at work? No, we were both professionals. We kept our grievances to our private lives. Professionally, we were both part of a team. I didn't have a lot to do with him, just help change the wheels or do whatever was necessary when he came into the pit. Apart from that, in recent weeks I rarely saw him. Do you mix with the Cagliari team at all? You've got to be joking, Wyman laughed. They'd cut our throats as soon as look at us. Imagine returning to Italy if you'd lost. That time they lost the World Cup, there were crowds waiting at the airport, baying for the blood of the manager and the team. The Cagliari team are out to win by fair means or feral. And if they could get away with killing Jim Tracy, they wouldn't think twice about it. You witnessed the accident? Yeah, Wyman grimaced. I was standing up on the observation platform as Tracy approached. He looked to be doing fine, nothing amiss as far as I could see, although there must have been. 
Then suddenly he seemed to lose control, and within seconds the car was an inferno. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I guess it could happen to any driver at any level, and there's not a thing he can do about it. I tell you, next time I do a couple of laps, it'll be uppermost in my mind. You've ambitions of your own on the circuit. It was a statement, not a question, for Adele knew that there were a few mechanics without aspirations that went beyond working in the pits. Yeah, I guess so, Sam Wyman grinned. I've done a few fair laps this year, but I've a long way to go. Four years ago I was working in the gun trade, but it was a dead-end job. Motor racing was always my first love. High profile, if you know what I mean. Now that they've banned handguns, you, you don't even have the hope of winning a gold medal pistol shooting at the Olympics. But in any case, it's nowhere near as glamorous as winning on the racetrack. There's nothing like motor racing to get the adrenaline pumping. So I thought I'd use my mechanical skills in the pits and take every opportunity I could to get behind the wheel and see how it went from there. A sensible approach. Odell turned away, addressed Brown. Now I think I'll speak with Agnelli, the Calieri manager. I'll be interested to discover whether this rivalry between the teams is all just hot air hype or whether he really does hate the opposition. Angeli was a small, excitable man, gesticulating as he spoke. He clearly resented being interrupted during his preparations for the morrow's heats. Tracy was a too old for racing, he waved his hands. As you people in Britain say, he was um, over the hill. He would not have won anyway, so why should my team want to kill him? But he was still one of the top racing drivers in the world. Odell regarded the other closely. He might just have won, his experience telling where it counted. Pa! Agnelli snapped. Uh, three years ago, yes. Uh, today, uh, tomorrow, no. No chance. Yet, by what you told the newspapers, your vitriolic attacks on Tracy, you still regarded him as a serious rival. Because it is what the public want to hear, bitter rivalry. The Italian retorted. The Cagliari team will qualify tomorrow in the first place. Tracy would have been no threat to us, but these accusations are upsetting the team. The other began shouting. And I cannot tolerate them. I shall sue for a lot of money if they continue. He protesteth too much, Brown quoted wryly as they left the Cagliari headquarters, which makes me think that there may not be smoke without fire. Perhaps, but it is his way. Odell answered. We mustn't jump to conclusions. Now, if it's possible, I should like to take a look at Tracy's body. Oh, if you wish. I should think that the post-mortem will be completed by now, and the body will be in the hospital mortuary. However, the pathologist will have missed nothing, I can assure you. I have worked with Colin Douglas too long to doubt his capabilities. All the same, I'd still like to take a look. Odell walked briskly towards their parked car, Brown and Tommy at his heels. "'As you can see for yourself, Mr. O'Dell,' Colin Douglas was tall, with greying hair, an austere man who was not accustomed to having his work questioned. "'The body is scarcely recognisable. Badly burned and with multiple injuries, several of which on their own could have been responsible for his death. Whichever one he died from, death was instantaneous, I can assure you. "'I am merely looking for my own satisfaction.' O'Dell was undeterred as he leaned over the charred corpse. Tracy had innumerable cuts and lacerations. Limbs were broken. His flesh was blackened by the intense heat. Douglas spoke the truth. If murder had been committed, then the means would surely have been in the car itself, and forensic tests had so far failed to come up with anything. Be my guest. The pathologist's sarcasm was undisguised. If you find anything I've missed, then you know you're welcome to my job. I retire next year. What's this? Odell's finger probed the neck, pushed at the charred flesh. Just one of many small injuries, which in itself is of no consequence. Douglas was at the detective's side instantly, studying the small, neat hole which Odell's finger had opened up. It was probably made by a sliver of metal or glass. Just too neat, Odell murmured. In fact, it's the kind of wound a bullet would leave. Except there is no bullet lodged in the body. Douglas sneered. If there was, I would have found it. See? His fingers pushed past Odell's. The hole is only a few millimetres in depth. There is no lodged bullet. There are many ways in which that hole could have been made in that terrible accident. I really do think that you are wasting everybody's time, Mr. Odell. If so, then I apologise. Raymond Odell was unruffled by the other's scathing comments as he straightened up. 
But I don't think I need to take up any more of your time, Mr. Douglas. I have seen all that I need to see. Now, Brown, let us proceed to our next call. With a bit of luck, we may be on to something. Neither Brown nor Tommy inquired further. They both knew Raymond O'Dell only too well. He would explain when he had the full facts, and not until. Sam Wyman lived in a small, whitewashed cottage on the edge of the rolling moorland, the habitat of grouse and deer, fox and badger, a landscape of purple heather with rugged mountains looming in the background. An idyllic retreat, Odell murmured as the three of them walked up the path towards the front door, and judging by the smoke coming from the chimney, there is somebody at home. But nobody answered their persistent knocking. He's maybe lit the fire and gone out. Brown stiffened as the unmistakable sound of a gunshot shattered the rural stillness. Come on, Odell turned and led the way around the rear of the building. It would seem that our man isn't very far away at all. The small rear garden was dominated by a rectangular shed constructed of corrugated tin sheets. Even as the three stood staring at it, another shot rang out from within, somewhat muffled by the building. But, but there was no bullet in Tracy's body! Brown's train of thought was accelerating. No, there wasn't. Odell's expression was grim. That's why we're here now. Let's see what Sam Wyman has to say for himself. They pushed open the shed door and gazed upon an indoor shooting range. At the far end, a number of targets were set in a sand pit. Wyman, wearing ear defenders and totally oblivious of the presence of the detectives, was aligning his pistol for yet another shot. Crack! He obliterated the bullseye in target number three. He was about to swing his sights onto the fourth target when he sensed, rather than heard, his visitors. At least we can arrest him for being in possession of an illegal handgun. Brown's officialdom, his training to uphold the law to its very letter, dominated. Odell's upraised hand silenced him. There were far more serious matters at stake. Mr. Odell! There was both surprise and alarm on Wyman's features. He laid the pistol down on a nearby bench, ripped off his ear defenders. I didn't expect. Of course you didn't. Raymond O'Dell smiled mirthlessly. The secret pistol range, hidden from the eyes and ears of the law, eh? But I would have thought you had done all the shooting you needed to do by now. I'm planning to immigrate to the States. Wyman's voice was loaded with panic. Handguns are legal there. I can shoot all I want at... Perhaps... Raymond O'Dell stepped forward, picked up another weapon which was lying on a bench. Ah, now everything fits. His tone was one of satisfaction. My word, this one still has an attachment fitted to it so that it can be screwed to another object, such as a pair of binoculars. How, how could you possibly know? The other was white and trembling. I half-guessed at the outset when I found marks on these binoculars that could only mean that some kind of attachment had been fitted to them at some time. Odile was examining the pistol intently, pursed his lips. An air pistol, a two two calibre, also a repeater, works on compression. Still, I suppose it had to be a repeater, because however good a shot you were, and I have already witnessed your superb marksmanship, you could not rely on a single shot finding its mark. See... Odell extracted a flexible tubular clip from the weapon. BB shot. Much easier and more effective for your purpose than the standard wasted air gun pellets. I know that the murder weapon could not possibly be a cartridge firing one, and that left only one other possibility. This. But there was no bullet in Tracy's body, Brown muttered in disbelief. So it can't possibly be murder, Ryman shrieked, beginning to panic. All right, I, I shouldn't be in possession of handguns, but that's all you can get me for. You know very well that no bullet would be found in the corpse, Odell continued. But there was one originally, and you knew that as well as I do. It wasn't powerful enough to kill, but it wasn't supposed to be. It was just enough to cause momentary pain and distraction, like a bee sting. Enough to make Jim Tracy lose control at high speed. The crash and the ensuing inferno did the rest, killed him, and melted the ice pellet which you had shot him with. Sam Wyman swayed unsteadily on his feet. Brown's supporting hand was firm, held him upright as well as ensuring that the mechanic did not make a dash for the door. Tommy bore and moved to cross, just in case. Let me explain fully. 
These were the moments which Raymond Odell lived for. The final assembly of a jigsaw puzzle and the explanation of detail to a dumbfounded audience. You were going to marry Claire Tracy in spite of her father's objections. You could have lived with that, but not with your future wife losing her considerable inheritance. You saw a way to change all that, to kill Jim Tracy before he altered his will. That way, Claire would have her inheritance much sooner than expected. Her mother had died during Claire's childhood, and there were no other beneficiaries of Jim's estate. You almost became a rich man. Almost. Wyman closed his eyes. He did not speak. I have no doubt that it was you who phoned Jim Tracy and made those death threats imitating an Italian accent. That way you added to the suspicion which would undoubtedly fall on the Cagliari team if murder was suspected. Two things aroused my suspicions when I examined the Masterson team pit. First, Tracy's accident had occurred within fifty yards of the pit, close enough for him to have been shot from the pit itself. But if that had happened, then how would the marksman go undetected by other members of the team? The only possible place that would provide him with enough privacy to carry out the shooting was that platform by the entrance. Here the murderer would not only be screened from view, but he also had an added field of vision, a vantage point from which to take his time and make sure of his shot, and his target would be getting nearer with every split second. Detective Chief Inspector Brown pursed his lips in a silent whistle. All you required was a few seconds, Odell went on. Doubtless you resorted to rapid fire with your BB repeater, but all you needed was for one bullet to find his mark, which it did, in Trace's neck, and that was enough to bring about his death. You had fixed the air pistol to your binoculars. Crowds at racetracks are accustomed to seeing team members using binoculars. They would not look twice. The report of an air pistol would go unheard above the roar of the cars. You were pretty safe. If it didn't work today, it would work tomorrow. You had time on your side, because you knew that Tracy would not go and change his will for a few days. All he had on his mind was the burning desire to win the World Championship again. But there was no bullet, Wyman protested weakly. Yes and no. Odell reached across the bench on which lay clean equipment for pistols and a number of other accessories. You used this. He held up a metal object with a slim cup-shaped end. A bullet mould. As a gunsmith, you would have been used to making your own ammunition, moulding bullets for all calibres. So, you adapted a 2-2 bullet mould to make BB pistol pellets. Ball bearings, in layman's terms. That was when you hit on the idea of the vanishing bullet. A bullet fashioned out of ice would have exactly the same striking velocity as a lead one, and, in any case, the victim's body temperature would melt it. For a trained gunsmith and pistol shot, the task was a relatively simple one. There were even ice cubes in the cooler in the pit restroom for you to use. You didn't have to aim for a bullseye. You only had to hit Jim Tracy somewhere on his body, enough to make him lose control. If you missed, nobody would be any the wiser. You could try again. You could be unlucky time after time, but your victim could only be unlucky once. And I think that just about sums it all up. If only you knew what he was like, the life he gave Claire, Sam Wyman groaned. Then you'd understand. He did not offer any resistance as Brown clicked the handcuffs. If you had killed for that reason alone, then I might have some sympathy for you, Raymond Odell snapped. But your motive was greed. All the same, I have to credit you with ingenuity. It was a clever plot, and it was almost a perfect murder. Almost. But not quite.